War breaks people. It breaks their bodies. It breaks their minds. And in the case of 1988's Grave of the Fireflies, all around the world, souls have been broken. Studio Ghibli's unforgettable tale is one of the most emotionally challenging viewing experiences I've had. And in this episode of Nightmare Fuel, I'm going to discuss, with spoilers ahead, why Grave of the Fireflies is not only frightening, but spiritual devastating. Before I do, just a quick notice about our upcoming new project, The Horror Exchange. If you want to be one of the first subscribers, there are links below. Thanks in advance. Right, let's do this. I've had several requests from the ghoul gang to cover this movie, particularly on some of the more emotional war films I've covered, like The Pianist Stand, Schindler's List. I've got to put myself in a certain frame of mind to create these war movie video essays, but as soon as I decided to finally tackle Grave of the Fireflies, I knew it was going to be a difficult task. The main reason why Fireflies is capable of breaking your heart is due to it displaying the unfiltered destruction of war through the eyes of a young child as one of its main characters. We follow Setsuko, a young Japanese girl circa the age of a toddler, and her older brother, a young man named Seta. We see the horrors of the Second World War come to Japan, as Seta attempts to care for and protect Setsuko. Therefore, not only do we receive a bleak war movie, but a family survival drama, and both sides of that combination conjure up a blend of terror and tragedy. Grave of the Fireflies opens with Seta, alone and dishevelled, trying to prop himself up against a pillar in a public train station. He collapses and dies, uttering his final word, the name of his little sister. That's a way to kick off proceedings, seeing the death of a fly-ridden young man, where many passers-by don't give him a first look, never mind a second one, and there are many others just like him in the surrounding area. A neglectful death, but one which allows his spirit to reunite with the spirit of Setsuko, as they hop onto a ghost train and begin to recite their story. Right away, there are hints here that Setsuko also didn't survive the story ahead, due to both now being in spirit form, but the extent of what these people faced was never never going to be easy to endure as a watcher. The story we see is a specific event from World War II, the bombing of Kobe, which took place on March the 16th and 17th, 1945. The United States forces intentionally bombed military and civilian targets, despite Kobe being the sixth largest Japanese city, with around a million residents at the time. Despite being in the closing stages of the Second World War, the US were still content in bringing an end to the Japanese threat, taking out countless innocent Japanese civilians in the process. Civilians just like Seta and Setsuko. The emotional bond formed with these siblings is so firm and loving. You don't want to see anything bad happen to them, particularly Setsuko, who is completely adorable. She's a tiny toddler, one who enjoys playing with her big brother. She loves eating fruit drops. She's just a normal kid who wants to explore the world and go on adventures and have fun with her family. The trouble for Setsuko is the world had other ideas, turning her playground into a battleground. The warning siren goes off in Kobe, indicating that enemy bombers are inbound, meaning that everyone has to head to the shelter. In the madness, Seta picks up Setsuko to run with her, but she drops a toy doll, and he makes the effort to collect it for her. Right away we understand just how much Seta cares for her. He knows that Setsuko losing her doll would be heartbreaking for her. Though there is an oncoming threat, Seta rushes to make sure his little sister can retain some kind of happiness in the aftermath of what is to come. Kobe is bombed, with the flammable housing being set ablaze. When Seta and Setsuko emerge after the bombing, near enough the entire city is now just ash as far as the eye can see. And we also see one of the film's most disturbing visuals, piles of charred human remains where the city of Kobe once stood tall. Though the lasting impression Fireflies has on me is in relation to Seta and Setsuko, its brutal moments like this peppered across the story, which ground the film in its historical influence. 
After seeing the destroyed city, Setsuko gets a little upset due to the likelihood their house is gone too. I've got to say, whenever Setsuko gets any level of sad in the film, it's absolutely crushing. Losing one of her shoes is a huge concern in her understanding of the world, despite the enormous worldwide war going on. And this war has a victim which impacts Setsuko and Seta their mother. She got caught in the air raid, and the next time Seta sees her, she's covered head to toe in weeping bandages. Christ almighty, this is a heavy gut punch, of which Fireflies offers up a plateful. Though the film provides a whimsical sense of fun in many segments, the force of war always interjects to blast unbridled carnage into the mix, to bring it back down to a harsh reality. Seeing the mother in a horrendous physical state is one shade of upsetting, but seeing Setsuko whimpering, saying she wants to see Mama, oh my goodness, this took the context to a whole new level. A toddler has just had her home destroyed and has been separated from her mother. All she wants is to see her, to make her happy. In a normal world, that would be a pretty easy fix, but the Second World War turned the planet upside down, and as such, Seta is powerless. No matter where they go for respite, the terrors of events creep their way into the scenery, such as when they go for a play day at the beach, but Setsuko finds a dead body covered in flies. No matter where you turn for peace, there's remnants of decay, and this is a problem Seta constantly faces from the wake of the bombing. Mama is severely injured. If he took Setsuko to see her, it could do more damage than not taking her. But either way, there's nothing he can truly do to fix his little sister. He wants her to feel happiness and go on adventures, just to be a happy child. But the war prevents that. All he can do is lie to her about Mama being okay, even after she ultimately dies from her injuries and is thrown onto a pile of burning bodies. He can't bring himself to tell her that because how could you possibly explain that to a child without hurting them? Seta doesn't want his little sister to experience any form of pain, so he's just got to absorb as much of it as he can. The scene where Setsuko sulks and Seta is in the background looking away, you can just tell what's going through his mind. He cannot make things normal. All he can do is try to make them a little better by entertaining Setsuko, taking her mind off things. That's what's so heartbreaking to me. Seta tries everything he can to mould the world around Setsuko into being a world fit for a child. He wants to create a bubble world of joy for her, even though the exterior to that bubble is full of death and suffering. Yet, as the film progresses, the bubble shrinks around Setsuko until it finally bursts. But prior to that, we see just how hard Seta tries for his sister. The most important thing is acquiring food and water, which Seta puts his life on the line to acquire, even at times making sentimental sacrifices and being begrudged in the process. After the bombing of Kobe, Seta is able to find his aunt who takes them in. Prior to the bombing, Seta buried a bunch of supplies for whenever he needed them, which he provides to the aunt as an exchange for shelter for him and Setsuko. You'd think that by being a relative and by being given supplies up front, that this aunt would want to take care of the kids. However, she winds up being nasty to them, convincing them to sell their mother's valuable silk kimono for food. This decision is sensible given the times they're living in, though it was a sentimental sacrifice suggested and pushed by the ant. And what's worse is even with the initial supplies, even after selling the kimono for supply money, even though Seta accesses his mother's bank and uses her money on even more supplies, the ant still resents the kids and insults them. She doesn't view Setsuko and Seta as family. She sees them as refugees who need providing for. In one sense, they are, yet despite Seta providing to the shared table in every way possible, it's still not enough for the ant's acceptance. They can't even turn to family in these times of desperation. And you can reanalyze the decisions here in a way where Seta has wasted some of his resources on providing supplies to the ant, only to be disregarded in return. She doesn't even think they're deserving of eating her food. But why the hell was she deserving of eating off of Seta's resources? After this aggravated friction, Seta finally 
snaps and departs with Setsuko, heading to an abandoned shelter out in the countryside. It's at this shelter where the film deteriorates into soul-shattering fragments of raw sadness. There's a deep rumbling of melancholy, simply anticipating where the film can head for these kids. We do receive a touching scene where they use fireflies to illuminate the shelter at night time. A truly beautiful moment and a breath of joy, which is almost immediately snuffed out the following morning when the fireflies lay dead. By this point, Setsuko has learned that Mama died, and now she faces life's gravest lesson, that things die. Even Sata experiences another death when he learns of the extreme likeliness that his father died in the Navy. Just another thing to add to his list of grief. But after Setsuko buries the fireflies in a grave, linking to the film's title, she questions why things have to die. It's so heartbreaking having to see life's great mystery, one which all of us contemplate, at such a young age and struggling to provide an answer that is fair. The world isn't fair, as we see through Sata's efforts and Setsuko's demise. She becomes ill from malnutrition, experiencing diarrhea as a consequence, with the doctor being passive and uncaring. All this child needs is food, he says, before examining the next patient. So easily said, not so easily done. Sata steals food from farmers' fields, but is apprehended and arrested. He runs into people's houses during air raids, putting himself in the firing line just so he can get food for his sister. He even withdraws the very last of his mother's money just to ensure he's tried every possible angle. We even get to a point where he scoops ice from the floor after it's being carved by, I assume, some kind of vendor, and placing it into Setsuko's mouth for some hydration. It's a desperate attempt to keep her alive, but in the end, it isn't enough. Sata returns to the shelter to find Setsuko lying in the grass, delirious. She's completely worn down. Insects crawl on her, her body decays, making her ribcage visible, her skin breaks out in rashes, and she struggles for breath. There's not much time left for her. Sata needs to get more supplies, but she begs with him not to leave her alone. This hits like a truck. She doesn't want her brother to leave her, even though it's a necessary evil to try and save her. When he gets back with some more food, she's lying in the shelter, sucking on marbles, which she imagines are her favourite fruit drops. She has rocks which she believes are rice balls for her and Sata to share. Her precious, creative, beautiful mind is drifting. Sata places a chunk of watermelon in her mouth and heads off to make her a meal. But we are hit with, for me personally, four of the most destructive words in the history of cinema. She never woke up. The image fixes on her body lying there with a half smile, the taste of something sweet in her mouth as she descends into eternal sleep. Having to watch the physical and mental breakdown, the suffering and ultimately the death of a little girl, a little girl who just wanted to have fun with her mother and big brother, who loved to play and had a wonderful imagination as children do, all of that has been torn apart by the impact of war. This is what happens when the planes fly overhead and bombs drop, when food becomes hard to get and there's nowhere truly safe to go. This is what happens. It can happen to anyone at any age. And in Grave of the Fireflies, it happens to this adorable, innocent child in a horrific way. Setsuko and her toy doll are cremated by Sata, and he places her ashes into her beloved fruit drop tin, which we now understand are what come out of the tin in the film's opening when a guard throws it into the tall grass. Now Sata and Setsuko's spirits are together again, reunited to spend eternity in each other's company, which is a bittersweet ending to the film. However, the path we've had to walk down to get to that result is nothing short.
sort of haunting. It's a different kind of nightmare fuel, this one. Yes, you've got the horrors of war in there with several graphic images, which will stick with me forever. But the core impact for me surrounds Seta and Setsuko. I feel like those who are parents or guardians of young children will be hit the hardest by this. I know I was, because I unintentionally placed my little loved one into the place of Setsuko, and that was a tear-jerking contemplation. War may be dictated by men, but the ripples of chaos spread to people of all ages, including our children. Children who deserve happiness, not death and destruction. And that is what makes Grave of the Fireflies one of the most important anti-war films ever made. Thank you for those who recommended this film as a Nightmare Fuel episode. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already. And once again, don't forget to check out The Horror Exchange. I've been Connor from Unleash the Ghouls. Cheers for watching and take care.